All right. Hello, everyone. Good morning from California. Good evening to those in London, especially Scott, one of our speakers here, who I'll intro here shortly. Um, this is going to be a great SBJ Live conversation. Uh, it's entitled Managing the Content Explosion in Live Sports and presented by Signets and NEP. And gentlemen, to the three of you, thanks so much for, for joining us. We have uh, Jay Deutsch, Director of Media Solutions um, US at NEP Group. We have Casper Schofa, Senior uh, Vice President of Global Product at NEP. And we have Scott Wall, Principal Solutions Architect at Signiance. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Appreciate you jumping on here. Let me do a quick like 30 seconds, just logistics for the audience, and then let each of you kind of do a bit of a, an intro here on, on your roles and, and we'll, we'll go from there. Um, so to our audience, thank you very much for, for jumping on. We have a number of people use this platform in a number of different ways, either attending live or using the uh, on-demand component, which has um, been something that we've gotten great feedback on and, and people love to view these conversations at their, at their convenience. And so that's a reminder that anyone who registered will have access to this recording after our conversation is done. Uh, also, I, I encourage everyone to use the chat, uh, you know, jump in, say, hi, this is so-and-so from California, et cetera, and get the conversation started. We see people often share their LinkedIn profiles. We've had some great connections come from these chats and, and that's always been really fun to see. Um, you can also ask, Questions, uh, I'll do my best to work them in as, as our moderator here today. And um, I think that's the majority of, of the, the details there. Um, I also realized I didn't introduce myself. My name is Taylor Bloom. I'm the head of sports technology business here at SBJ. So always happy to be having some technical conversations with, with great guests. And that's definitely what we have here today. With that, Scott, you mind doing just like a 30 second intro on yourself, your 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 role, your top priorities right now, and then Jay and then Casper? Yeah, no worries at all. Thanks for having me today. Really appreciate it. Looking forward to this session with the guys. So I've been with Signiant for around seven years now, and I'm the principal solution architect heading up uh, the team involved in our sales engineering and solution architecture teams, effectively working in both a pre and a post sales function to enable the successful deployments and uh, installations of Signet software. Thanks, Taylor, thanks. Jay. Taylor, thanks for having me. Uh, Jay Deutsch, I oversee the Media Solutions Group within NEP US. Um, we really specialize in large volume ingest, content acquisition, media management, quick turnaround production. Uh, we have a small group of specialists that help to deploy, configure, and support some Signiant-based workflows. Um, so we're here, happy to be talking about it today. And I'll pass over to Casper. Yeah, thank you as well. Um, happy to be here. Uh, I um, have been working with NP for the past 10 years in multiple capacities, uh, originally Dutch, um, but living in Los Angeles, um, very focused on expanding the uh, capabilities that NEP has around the, the group, uh, working closely with Jay and also Scott in some of the deployments that we did um, around the world on uh, large events. So looking forward to this discussion. Thank you, gentlemen. And Casper, that's a great segue. I, I wanted to set the tone for, for our audience here. Can you talk about some of the deployments and the work you've done with Signiant and kind of give us the idea of your interactions? Sure, yeah. I mean, um, we've been focusing on a lot of kind of distributed workflows where, uh, you know, teams are not in the same location all the time uh, and content needs to flow between teams at rapid speeds. And that's where um, we've been working very closely with uh, Scott and his team um, in order to do that. But around the globe, you know, like uh, projects that we have been working are on are uh, what you what you can see. We're involved in the Olympics right now. We've been involved in the Euro 2024 um, with the uh, Hive media server that uh, um, UEFA hosts. Um, we we are involved um, a very in a very detailed capacity on a weekly basis with um, MLS um, and their uh, content management capabilities that are very distributed, meaning uh, 14 different venues on a uh, on a Saturday. <laughs> With, um, with multiple locations that are all working in tandem that we can um, definitely speak to uh, a little bit more detail. Love it. Scott, from a singing perspective, anything you wanna add in terms of how you guys work together? No, no, no. I think the one thing that I'd add to this is that 
our partnership with NEP brings this unique lens to that sort of event world, the large scale event world. We see things from production based workflows from the remote side, the distributed side of that. And it's um, it's a really important thing to, to have this discussion on. Looking forward to it. So with that in mind, we the title here, you're seeing the, the content explosion phrase being used. Guys, talk to me about that. I'll throw this out to the three of you, whoever wants to jump in. When you see that phrase, like content explosion, what does that mean to you and how does that really impact your production workflows and, and any um, adjustments to your priorities you need to make? Um, I'll leave that there. Who wants to jump in? I, I, I'd love to. <laughs> like, uh, what, what I what I see is that, um, you know, the number of outlets that we need to distribute content towards are just growing, right? Like, I mean, it used to be, and this is already quite some time ago, just linear. Uh, then OTT came in and now we also have social. And uh, even though that seems like just three outlets, there are multiple outlets in multiple locations, depending on also how the rights are are distributed. And and I think this is essentially where this this distributed workflow plays in. And, and you know, like on the live side, NEP is very present into making distributed workflows with live content available uh, across either you know a market the size of the us or even across the globe and working closely in partnership with the signian team we're also doing that on the file based um, uh, from a file based perspective because um, it's challenging to do version control and and make sure that the files are present when when they're needed for editors and social media teams to publish them um, in the right uh, manner yeah kicking over to Jay and Scott, who probably can speak a lot more detail to that. Yeah, I think it's it's exciting what Casper mentions in terms of, you know, more cameras, more formats, uh, you know, higher definition, higher bit rate content. Um, and then where our group gets involved is actually getting that content, you know, from its point of creation, which might be a mobile unit, a studio, a fly pack, what have you, and getting it to maybe one specific group of users or maybe to multiple outlets requiring transcode workflows, rewrap workflows, live streaming workflows, live clipping kind of workflows. What Signet has really helped us to do is get the files that are created on site at the event, whether it be sports or entertainment, what have you, and get that as expeditiously as we can to another endpoint somewhere else for other users to benefit from it, whether that be post-production, whether that be a live studio environment like we do for MLS currently. Um, there's just a whole different range of um, workflows that benefit from this kind of accelerated file transfer we get from Signet. Um, and over the years, it's been interesting to see the, the different products like evolve naturally and also get some um, feedback into the hands of, of Scott and the Signet team for what we see as being improvements. So the uh, the collaboration's really been uh, hand in hand. Scott? Yeah, no, 100% agree. This is a partnership between us and NEP and some of the insights that Casper and Jay give us are invaluable, especially with these with the MLS projects. One thing that we're trying to do and provide here is give that level of control and visibility to the team, understand when the content's created where it's been moved to and owning that whole chain of custody. So in the end, their end customer has line of sight of where the content lived, where it's been moved to and where it's ended up. And a, yeah. and a real important part of that, just to, to add on to that, Scott, is the ability to have that kind of job monitoring, to have some kind of a dashboard where you can look and you can say, you know what, we're doing 35,000 file transfers today from site to studio. How do I find that one or two that are in question? You know, yeah. and having a tool set to be able to do that kind of thing is really important. And we've looked at the way that our platform's been built in a cloud native way is that ability to scale, right? 35,000 files is not a small amount in any shape or form, right? And that's weekend after weekend after weekend. So continually delivering with this team has been exceptional. So what are some of the biggest product evolutions that fans will notice here? You guys are talking about some, you know, seriously upgraded product workflows behind the scenes, you know, going from site to studio, like you just mentioned, Jay. What's the output for for fans that's that's different for them now than maybe it was when we were just linear, like like Casper said? I think the, the content gets out the door quicker. Yeah. Okay. Because because at the site there might be three four hundred different clips created throughout the event. All right. 
And then one of those clips, as it's created, can be immediately sent back to a creative studio, to creative uh, groups, to be able to either add into a package, a promo, uh, some kind of teaser type of content, and have a much more collaborative workflow with the truck as well. So when you have those clips being created quickly, distributed out to different teams, that means the content's going to reach audiences quicker, whether it's social media, whether it's linear, or, <laughs> or, or even some production end users. Mm -hmm. Other thoughts on that? Certainly well. Yeah, I think it's also the sheer volume, right? Like, like yeah. the, the, you know, I, I always think social or marketing teams of our customers would take anything to publish, right? Like, like as long as they can get relevant content, they'll publish it, <laughs> you know, like, because it's it, it, because of the, the consumption mechanisms that nowadays exists with, with the consumers that are out there, like they want short clips. They want relevant clips um, that that are served uh, to their needs, and and I think this infrastructure that we are all putting together as an industry, um, uh, both on the live side, but also where live transverses into file-based um, distribution workflows, like that's the key. Like the, the faster we can make this, the the better it is for for our clients and and the, and the consumers in the end. Mm -hmm. What adjustments have you guys seen based on the workflows you're creating from the marketing side of things? Like you're talking about the clips the marketing team wants to create. Can you talk about that briefly of, of anything noticeable? Because Casper, you were just mentioning, I mean, I think we're all following the Olympics right now and just the, the quick social clips like immediately after a medal is won are massive. And there's a whole edit and production set up behind the scenes there um, that that's just critical. How, how have you guys been interacting with marketing teams and how has that changed uh, as of late, if at all? I can mention something that we've done um, within one of our tool sets, one, within one of our NEP products, where we gave a client the ability to immediately create MP4s out of a live video stream, immediately. Yeah. Mark, you're in, mark, you're out. You got your MP4, do what you want with it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that, that may seem very simple and and, and, and easy to do, but that's, uh, that's a very well calculated kind of feature that has to be built into a, to a product. Um, that's one example of access to that quick live content, mm -hmm. get, get media that's, let's say, social media ready and be able to upload, push, post wherever you need to. That's one quick example. It also goes into kind of the, um, the client that we're dealing with or the clients that we're dealing with because you, you mentioned the Olympics, right? Like I don't have to educate anybody on how many rights um, holders there are for the Olympics content, I, I would presume. Um, similar for some of the other projects that we work with, right? Like each each and every distribution outlet has their own needs, their own wishes, their own uh, requirements. And it's really building out that what I, what I would call a distributed workflow where we have, we have the live, we have the isolated camera feeds that we are ingesting the whole time great right that's where it starts capturing the content but what happens next right like how how do we make sure that the relevant content is identified through tagging logging uh producers working on on that that type of content then how do we get it as quickly as we can to editors that make it beautiful right in, in in forms of highlights and and all the creative work that goes into that and then how do we get that out there onto onto the different platforms because obviously social is social media platforms are important but you know don't underestimate the uh highlight edits that are created for vod purposes or promos or or you know like even even commercials right like like all the sponsors that want access to their content that they have been sponsoring in order for their platforms again to be more content rich, et cetera. Like it, it's just it's just massive and growing and growing and 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 having the tool sets and having the capabilities and having the people um, first and foremost that understand that and um, that can work together in in creating that experience is I think what we all the, all the people that are here on the call are are about. I think that's well said, Casper. One thing you mentioned I was going to ask about is just the different cameras and camera angles and shots we're seeing nowadays. It's not just staring down the 50-yard line of an NFL game anymore. There's, there's cameras in pylons and in the roofs and everywhere. Has that changed any um, 
anything significantly in your mind in terms of product workflow and then output to fans? Sure. I mean, uh, it's fun, funny that you mentioned those because those are products that we actually develop. So the, like the pylon camera is something that came from our team and was was set up. Um, you know, like, like all those new content elements are generally first and foremost created for live or, or you know, replay in, in the live match. But but indeed, like we're ingesting those and, and we have access to those uh, feeds for uh, widespread distribution. So um, that helps feeding the, the content beast, if you like, right. um, for, for the downstream distribution. A quick shout out. So just randomly, Jesse, Dick, JB, thank you for throwing comments in the chat. Please, you know, keep, keep jumping in there. I see a couple of questions. I'll try to try to work in here. Um, so Scott, Jay, Casper, for, for you guys, we're, I think, kind of alluding to large scale broadcasts and projects right now. What about on the local, smaller side? Where are you guys involved in there? What changes are you seeing there? Um, I, I, there's a lot of, from what I've said, a lot of automation, a lot of ability to capture things on a phone nowadays. Um, so it's just opening up access to a lot of different sporting events from youth up to amateur and then to pro. How is how is that proliferation kind of impacting your roles at Signet and, and NEP? And again, a question for the group. I, I think that uh, one advantage for those smaller productions where you need to spin up something relatively quickly and it may not last a very long time, maybe two weeks, maybe two days, maybe a month, okay, um, as opposed to a longer term uh, infrastructure that has to be built up, stood up and supported. Um, something that we've come to like a lot and we'll give a plug here, of course, to uh, the Media Shuttle product. We've liked being able to spin up a portal very quickly um, add a bunch of users very quickly, um, you know, theme up the background, uh, send out the activations and onboard everyone really quickly. Um, and so it was something that our team of specialists and engineers and, and designers were able to, to learn very, very quickly. And that was very important to us too. The learning curve on some of these new technologies can't be so extreme that it takes your staff, you know, six, 12 months to, to start learning it. Um, with the media shuttle, we were able to jump in and, and really go quickly. And that's one of the tools that helps us in those small environments where we need that kind of like sharing capability, sharing workflow, but we need it like now, and we're going to turn it off in a week. Yeah. So with the media shuttle product as part of the Signal platform, its ability to scale from those small productions up to large scale projects like the Olympics. Um, is very simple in its approach and in its administration. So giving that delegated administration models, multiple outputs in terms of reporting, again, that control and visibility is really important for across the board for, for our customers and Jay's team being able to take it on board and, and spin this stuff up within seconds. Uh, and also programmatically, this stuff can be administered in a manual fashion, but also the way we lead with API first um, architecture, they can tie it in with their uh, programmatic uh, work at, at the uh, essence. Hmm. Building on this, um, I'm trying to word this properly, but are fan expectations of content at the end of the day of what they see on their phones or laptops or televisions, is it higher or lower nowadays in terms of the, you know, kind of the content that's being generated? Do they just want access to everything quickly or do they want everything at a high production value, um, you know, complicated workflows to get it there? Or is it just so quick they were like, just give me a clip and let me move on. I want to see my favorite athlete and, and get out of here. How, how does how do you guys kind of resonate with that question? I, I'd say they want high quality content quickly. <laughs> so, yeah, they want it all both, yeah, all the time. Yeah. yeah. Which is which is the the key <laughs> and, and and also the challenge. Yep. And edited and, and sliced up for their specific interests. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. if it doesn't look nice, I mean, um, even if if you look in your own, you know, private uh, environment, like people make pictures, and if they don't look nice, they don't like the picture, right? So, so we have to work on, uh, we have to work on creating that um, experience, which is largely driven by creative intent, right? Like the, the creatives that we work with define how the images should look like, how they should sound like. Um, how long they should be 
for what specific platform, et cetera, et cetera. And then we, as, as this team, need to figure out how we get that done um, within you know, seconds, minutes, whatever it may be, in order to not lose the um, value of news, right? Like, if, especially, especially if we speak about sports content, uh, it's, it's, it's like, you know, publishing news. You can be, you, if, if somebody with an iPhone is faster than you, that's annoying, right? Like, like, yep. so we, we have to work towards um, getting those, those quick and very high quality, high value um, items out there with the sheer volume increase that uh, people nowadays expect. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the beginning, uh, Casper, from an NEP perspective. This is for all three of you, but it's kind of going back to what some of the intros. Um, I know there's partners you work with. You always you can't always divulge yet, but then you mentioned Major League Soccer as being one. I'd love to go into detail on that. Like, what is that workflow like? What is that setup like? That partnership like? Um, I think you mentioned you know you're working across 14 different production sites. There, give us a give us a lay of the land of. What that's like today, how it's evolved recently, and you know what are what are the expectations there? Yeah, I'll I'll start and then I'll kick it to Jay, who can get into much more detail. Um, but um, I'll start with the live side of things, right? So we on a um, on a what we call an MLS uh, match match day, we deploy um, uh, up to fourteen um, OB trucks, um, tw ten to twelve camera uh, productions that uh, go to um, 14 MLS venues that are all across the, the country, like um, from you know, the West Coast to the East Coast, everywhere, uh, wherever they play games. And those, uh, like essentially what we are driving towards is that um, most games um, start at the same time from a time zone perspective. Um, so you, you, it could be as busy as having 14 games going on at the same time. Um, and um, each of those games are producing um, the live feed, um, which goes to um, US and world distribution. Um, then uh, they create a lot of content clips like melts, um, um, you know, like the full match records. Um, the, 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 there's a lot of content generated because we do replay clips, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's all within each of those um, uh, mobile unit environments, right? So times 14. Then we need to access all that uh, content um, remotely because we have our studio show production, which takes place in New York. We have our uh, live ingest platform for um, our, our uh, media bank product, which is being accessed to uh, generate um, um, logs and clips and, and, and distribute highlights uh, downstream for uh, everything that we've been speaking about, like social, et cetera. Then we have um, our South Florida fac facility um, uh, that is also creating a lot of, that is doing a lot of content management and clip management and um, downstream distribution to multiple outlets um, for MLS as well. Um, with another facility in LA that also needs access to all the content. So it, as you can see, it's, 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 it's widespread, very distributed, many different um, uh, basically operators working in tandem from different locations. And um, I like to kick it to Jay to go into a little bit more detail as to how that actually comes together. Yeah, Casper, that's a great overview. Um, where I'll take over now is let's imagine one of those 14 different matches. Okay. Um, there are clips being created even before the match, of course, you know, warm ups, the walk ins, fans, so on and so forth. That content's very valuable for the editors and the producers in the studio that are putting together a, a five, six hour long studio show. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we have the ability now to get content from that one truck back to the studio within a couple minutes. Okay. Clip gets created. It gets archived, goes through one of our NEP designed ingest servers, which runs Signet software, and delivers it back to the studio within a couple of moments. Now, does it take one minute or three minutes? Look, that's going to change depending upon the load, depending upon bandwidth and so forth. But the fact of the matter is, is we can get clips from the truck back to the studio in a matter of minutes. All right. That's a huge benefit for the creative staff in the studio that's looking for fresh content about that game. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. And like Casper said, we do that times 14. So as there are six matches that all kick off at 730, well, we're getting clips from all six of those matches before the kickoff. So now the creative teams in the studio can start putting together stories, editorial pieces, features, what have you. It's much more interesting. Okay, so getting those what we call best clips into the studio has really been a, a, a workflow that's um, been locked in, been in place for almost two season, season and a half now. We started doing this beginning of uh, 2023 season uh, and the studio staff really relies on it. You know, we'll actually, we'll, our support staff will get reached out to saying, hey, we haven't seen any clips from uh, Kansas City yet. Oh, we go take a quick look. We turn on Kansas City. They start getting the clips. Uh, and we can do that thanks to some of the tools that we have with uh, with Jet now, Signet Jet. It's a great overview, guys. Um, thank you. It leads me to one of my next questions. Well, Taylor, Taylor yeah. one, one, let, me, let me say one thing that I forgot to mention. We also now are able to stage content for the trucks. So let's imagine those 14 trucks, they're all in transit during the week. They get to their locations on Saturday for match night. Now, there's some new promos and teasers and front ends and things like this that have been put together all week in the studio. Well, when those trucks come online, they get the updates. OK, so all 14 of those trucks will get the new front ends, the new cappers, the new promos, the new whatevers that came from the studio without having to make a phone call and say, hey, send me all the new stuff. It happens automatically. Love it. Okay. That's very helpful, Jay. Thank you. Scott, from your perspective, you know, we're seeing what fits into that. Um, anything you want to add to the context that Casper and Jay mentioned? Yeah, no. So uh, us working there and acting as that plumbing for the, for the, for those, um, uh, matches is, is very important. Also leveraging other aspects within the jet products. So we have a, a next generation, um, transport protocol which leverages AI and machine learning to move content as quick as possible between point A and point B. So sometimes the matches that are closer to these hubs will use a different protocol compared to another one. So our efforts here at Signiant are to move those files as fast as possible. And that's totally abstracted from the from from the NEP team, it happens in an automated fashion, but it helps them get that content, whether it's to the truck or to the base for any of these different workflows as quick as possible. Hmm. So given the context you three just mentioned and that, that workflow and this, this massive distributed production, um, one question we had from, from JB, thank you in our chat, I'm kind of adapting it a tiny bit for this. Um, he's just saying, what is attracting the younger audience, if anything, nowadays to tune into live games, live content. You guys just went through a number of amazing um, you know, capabilities you provide for the production teams, the marketing teams, and what's working uh, that you guys are hearing with getting younger audiences to tune in live versus just saying, oh, I'll catch it on TikTok or Twitter or whatever. Question for the group. I mean, uh, one yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. One thing for me is UGC has always been around, but it's getting that UGC content into that main feed, making it sort of relatable to, to Gen Z or to whatever generation it is, uh, the TikTok generation. Now we want to be seeing that fan-led interaction. We want to be seeing sort of the, the Arsenal fan TVs creating their content, but bring that into a main feed, seeing different sides of the operation, seeing different sides of a match day. I think that's really important for, for people going forward. Yeah, I, I agree. Like, I think this highly depends, Taylor, on our clients, right? Like, like mm -hmm. our, our clients truly define um, what the content outlets are going to be. So it's, it's, it's more like we, we provide the technology solutions around right. the requirements that our clients set forth. Um, so for example, what, what we are seeing happening right now is that clients are looking for, you know, very specific niche alternative feeds, um, of a certain player or of a certain, you know, like event around the main event that becomes more interesting for younger audiences. Um, so, so our clients are definitely experimenting with, um, with different um, and alternative viewing um, um, setups, but but again, like we like whatever they come with to us around, like this is a creative intent that we have. 
we will find a solution towards because we do have the content, we do have the network, we do have the the the, the capabilities to cater to those needs. It's really about what is the creative intent? What do we want to show the the, the end consumers? Um, because in my opinion, from a technology perspective, that's entirely possible. Jay, did you add anything there? Well, a little earlier on, you were talking about the different angles, the different specialty cameras, you know, the pylons, the, uh, the spider cams, yep. uh, you know, roof cams and so on. I think that just goes to show what the audience actually really wants to see. You know, we wouldn't be putting these tools together, um, you know, for fun, so to speak. I mean, look, our job is fun. I think we can all agree with that. But at the same time, um, it's not like these ideas are just coming out of nowhere. They're coming out of like what, what end users want to see, what the creative staff on the production teams are, are, are able to actually put together for end users and that, that user generated content, like you said, Scott, like getting that into the main program somehow is going to, is going to be more engaging, is going to lock in viewers, uh, because they, they, they have that, that, that personal connection to the UGC content, as opposed to just a static feed of, you know, something. I think it's very fair. That kind of goes into my next question is you guys talk to me about streaming and direct to consumer and now going forward. I mean, there's just gonna be more games on obviously like Apple or Amazon or, you know, WWE is going to be on Netflix. There's, there's all these new um, entrants into the traditional viewing model for fans. How does the, the growth of D to C streaming impact your guys's roles and the, and the production workflow you've been mentioning, if at all, I'd be curious to kind of, understand that better, make sure people out there understand any changes you guys have had to go through. I think, I think, and I'll, I'll just, I'll say this candidly, I think the real difference is like the transmission is a lot different, okay? The production aspect and giving uh, the audience what they wanna see in terms of angles, in terms of replays, in terms of highlights, how quickly can we get them a highlight? How quickly can we get them a replay? That stuff doesn't change to us. At least I don't see that changing in the near foreseeable future. So it's more so like an adaptation to the, transmission aspect of the production, you know, where the, the created content, where the program is going, the technology is going to be a little different to get it there, of course. But I think at the end of the day, production doesn't change too much. Thoughts on that? Anyone else? Yeah, I, I, I think it, it highly, again, it highly depends on, on the creative side of, of things, in my opinion, because I do what I do see with um, the different clients that we serve is that they have different approaches to what type of content they want to release on their platform and as, especially with the direct to consumer platforms you see that there's a lot of alternate alternative yeah alternative content that they want to generate to also release on their platforms in in addition to um the live feed and and, and i think everybody has like every client has a different strategy in that sense a different creative or content strategy that we need to cater to um but to jay's point from a technology perspective or, or solutioning perspective, it is very similar for us. Um, it's just a matter of, um, again, how do we, how can we reduce speed as much as, we, or, or sorry, how can we increase speed as much as we can mm -hmm. or reduce the weight for uh, the specific creative intents that our clients have? Mm -hmm. Scott? Yeah, no, and I think the way that we look at it as is exactly what this session is about, right? It's more content. People are maintaining, they still add dollars in the traditional linear broadcast. They're going to continue for forever. You've got the DTC component, but that's additional content being created. And again, we're help facilitating that move with our partners like NEP. We're there to help provide the, the destination, the support, the movement, the control, the visibility, the acceleration across that, that real estate for them. One other topic I want to discuss and get your guys' input on is just in general, security, cybersecurity. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't have at least one question about this, given two weeks ago, the CrowdStrike global issue that was really serious, I think opened a lot of people's eyes. Thankfully, I guess that wasn't like a bad actor. That was just internal processes. But talk to me about as, as we're producing more content, as the, the content explosion in live sports continues, what new exposures or risks does that open up uh, that you guys are are thinking about or aware of or having to work into your workflows to get the content produced and sent and shared in, in ways you're you're you've been explaining to to this point? 
I think that without getting into a whole cybersecurity, you know, forum here, which we can easily go down that path, and that's that's obviously not the intention here. Uh, an important part of the file transfer aspect and security, and security of those files and those recordings and, and the content that gets created, is encryption along its path. Okay, uh, and that's something that we can get with the, the products we've been deploying from Signiant is that end-to-end -end encryption, and that's super important to us. Mm -hmm. So when we need to move content from point A to point B. And we can do it with a platform that has the monitoring, the dashboards, the statistics, all this, and the encryption end to end. I mean, that that really checks the box for, box for us, and that's uh, that was a requirement that uh, we definitely have in play now. Yep, I I I think that's well said, Scott Casper. Would you guys add anything to this? I think it's fair, Jay. You're not looking to make this a cybersecurity forum. I like how you worded that, but I think it's a very important question to to touch on. No, like I, I second basically what Jay said. I, I would, I would add that, um, you know, like given those distributed workflows, you will need to use public internet, right? Like, like there's, yeah. there's no way around that. Like, obviously, we try to um, use private networks as, as uh, uh, wherever we can. Um, not, not just because of security, also because of reliability. Um, but, um, but you, using public internet, it requires you to work with products that um, allow you to, um, uh, you know, do a secure content um, um, interaction. And Signian definitely provides that. I'm sure Scott can, can speak a little bit more educated about that. Yeah, I'd say for us, authentication and authorization are key. And like Jay said, that encryption along along the line is massively important to us and available across the, the Signian platform. But enforcing role-based access control with regards to users, um, supporting multi-factor authentication is key for us across our, our suite of products. And guys, we're, we're approaching the 40 minute mark here. So I always like to like do a bit of a look forward um, as well. And, you know, we're sitting here, Paris Olympics are going on. We've talked about the you know, Major League Soccer production work you guys do. Like there's just, there's such scale to leagues and major events nowadays. Um, and it just feels like that's never gonna slow down, frankly. As we sit here, I'm, I'm close to LA. Casper, you're in LA. I'm kind of looking already ahead to LA 28. Maybe in the next four-ish years, let's say, let's give it an Olympic time frame. What are some of the biggest changes you guys are thinking we'll see in the live sports? um production space and what's maybe being worked on now that that fans and partners and broadcast partners are going to start to really appreciate and question for the group you guys have been great with uh making me not have to call on anyone and just continue to jump in i mean like ai is obviously a hot topic right like um how can ai help create content um I, like i like to put it that way also, because I don't think AI will replace creative. Like, like uh, honestly, the, the the creative work that goes into um, making those clips, making those fan experiences, is 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 huge. Uh, but what AI can do is help um, fast, you know, make it faster. And and to what we uh, I think during this panel um, have been discussing a lot is like how can we get the content out there faster, but with the creative intent that our customers want. I think that's that's one of the things that I think within the next four years will be more we will be more uh, become more accustomed to right like mm -hmm. um, I I'd, I'd say there's other industries now doing a lot of testing for us and once that kind of solidifies um, uh, there will be a road I think for us to implement that in our workflows as well um, in in a solid secure and um, um, you know like um, distributing let uh, approach. Hmm. Scott or Jay, would you add anything on the AI front? And then we can go back to the overall question as well. But that is, of course, a topic I wanted to touch on a bit. Ready to touch on the overall. Sure. <laughs> go for it, Jay. Um, um, so so go on. we talk about we talk about more content. We talk about access to content. Um, but from a from a production sense, Right. I think what we'll see a few years from now is a reliance on more connected productions, let's call them, where you've got a core of equipment, you've got uh, ingest happening somewhere, but your operational base and your creative staff may not all be directly attached geographically uh, to that production. We're going to see a lot more of that. And of course, you know, that this all started uh, a few years back during COVID. We all had to get creative in remote ways of working. But those uh, those ways are here and they're tried and true and 
they've been working on a, a day-to-day basis for not just us, but for many in the industry. Uh, and I think that that's, that's, a, that's a shift we're going to continue to see. Uh, those connected productions are going to become more elaborate. They're going to le- leverage more, uh, potentially more cloud-based, uh, you know, uh, systems and, and infrastructures as opposed to fully on-prem data centers. Uh, it's it's an exciting time, but look, where we're going to be in the next five years, uh, it's all, we grow at such a rapid pace in this industry. Uh, and I think that what we're talking about here really does help to pave the way uh, to get that content somewhere faster. All the rest of it is going to fall into place. It's nicely said, Jay. Scott, closing thoughts on... Yeah, no, I agree exactly what Casper and, and Jay have said there. I think from a connectivity standpoint, those dispersed creative teams, we're going to be seeing improved connectivity. So networks becoming faster. Yeah. And for us at Signium, that's that's a massive advantage. The larger the network connection, the faster the Signium product can do. So the faster we can help people like NEP move that content between those distributed locations. Well, guys, I think we've covered a number of topics that I always like to try to get through a lot of different topics so our viewers can latch on or reach out to you guys and see if they want to go deeper on anything. Any additional closing thoughts maybe I didn't get to that you want to um, mention? I'll just make a quick remark um, that uh, really partnering with Signiant and their product team uh, and the different business teams has been uh, has been a great experience so far. I think that together we're helping to build a better platform and product for our, our overall market, not just for NEP, but for the market, for the industry in general. Uh, and that's something that Signet and NEP both have dedicated to do. Uh, and we look forward to that. Our team has become uh, very well versed in the uh, the different offerings and in the different uh, you know competition that's out there as well. Um, and I think that uh, working with Signet going forward is going to be a great experience for us and ultimately our end users too. Yeah, and in, in addition to what Jay said, I think, you know, like, in the next uh, few years, given the rapid growth of our industry and the rapid content requests that we get, um, you know, collaborative innovation models like the ones that we're working on with Signiant are hugely important to drive our industry forward. And I think that's um, where we are very, um, very much focusing on is to work very closely with our partners uh, and our partners being both, you know, people that build products and provide products for our users in the solutions that we build, but also our clients. Like we, we all need to work together um, to uh, drive this industry forward to the next stage. And, and uh, it requires, um, first of all, a mind of innovation um, uh, w- within the creative uh, components. Um, and then uh, a mind of innovation with, uh, with, with uh, the people that you have on this call. Yeah. I think that's well said. Well, Jay, Scott, Casper, thank you guys very much for, for joining us. Um, appreciate it. And again, as a reminder, those that registered, you can access this on demand. So come back and, and check it out uh, whenever you like. And we will leave it at that. Thank you very much, everyone, for, for tuning in. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank Good you. Take care. Bye-bye.